Hi, and welcome back to Unseen, a podcast dedicated to UK missing people. This is the third and final episode about the disappearance of Lord Lucan. If you haven't listened to the last two episodes, The Missing Lord and The Investigation, it would be a good idea to go back and listen to those now. Be advised that we are dealing with a sensitive subject that will include violence and subjects that may not be appropriate for everyone. Now, at the end of the last episode, we discussed the aftermath of the murder, the trial and investigation, and how Lord Lucan was seen by the criminal system. During the years directly following the murder, many theories have flown around surrounding Lucan's disappearance. The theories vary from relatively plausible to distinctly absurd, but all theories about the case are important to understanding how Lucan has been portrayed over the years since he was last seen on the 8th of November 1974. The question that continually plays over and over in my mind is what happened to Lord Lucan? Three theories are generally brought up in relation to his disappearance. While Lucan's fate has remained a mystery to this day, his abandoned car has opened up many different possibilities for what could have happened to him. One of the prevailing and least bizarre of the theories surrounding the case is that Lucan simply died or killed himself after leaving his car. This was a theory shared by the superintendent in charge of the case, his wife Lady Lucan, and some of the people closest to Lucan straight after the incident. Detective Chief Superintendent Roy Ranson initially thought that Lucan had done the honourable thing and fallen on his sword. Lucan's friend John Aspinall also believed that the Earl was guilty of the murder and was, quote, 250 feet under the channel. In a similar way, Lady Lucan believed that her husband had killed himself like the noble man that he was. While Roy Ranson and John Aspinall did not stick to this one theory of the case themselves, it was a belief that many had, seen as they could not see a way that Lucan would have been able to hide with the amount of coverage of the case, both nationally and worldwide. Having a look at the area in which Lucan left his car, Norman Road in New Haven, it is easy to see where John Aspinall got his idea that Lucan was in the English Channel. For those not familiar with UK geography, you can have a look on Google Maps and see whereabouts Lucan left the car in relation to the English Channel. New Haven is a port town situated between Eastbourne and Brighton, and the port leads directly into the English Channel. Norman Road, where the car was left, is situated nearly 5 minutes drive, or 20 minutes walk, to New Haven Harbour, and would have been easy to get to from that location. There is no question that Lucan found himself in a dire situation, and would have felt backed into a corner. But the problem with this theory is, where is his body? Would it not have appeared in the time after his disappearance? And how would he have killed himself? The only objects that were found in the car were the lead pipe bandaged with surgical tape and a full bottle of vodka. Neither of these things could be plausibly used in a suicide attempt. It cannot be ruled out, however, that Lucan had had things inside the car when he had made his escape that he had taken with him and were still unknown to police. It is common knowledge that up until her death this year, Lady Lucan was convinced that her husband had committed suicide. In the months directly after Lucan's disappearance, another theory became apparent. Lucan had disappeared to another country using a new identity. In Australia in 1974, reports of a smartly dressed, well-spoken man putting money into the bank using two different names and reading English newspapers was called into Melbourne police. These leads seemed promising and the police began to believe that they may have found Lucan. 
This seemed plausible as well, as Interpol had stated that they had reason to believe that Lucan could be in Australia. The Australian police requested pictures from Scotland Yard of Lucan for comparison to the man that they had found. The police staked out the flat where he was living, however when they made entry to the property in December 1974, they realised that they had not found Lucan, but a British Member of Parliament called John Stonehouse. The interesting part of the story, however, was that John Stonehouse had apparently died in Miami on the 20th of November 1974, almost two weeks after Lucan had gone missing. He was found to have faked his own death by leaving a pile of clothes on a beach in Miami and disappearing under a fake name. Due to the proximity of time to Lucan's disappearance, John Stonehouse was under scrutiny as he appeared to be a British man hiding his identity. Stonehouse had been living with his mistress and secretary, Sheila Buckley, while in Australia, and after being arrested, he was brought back to the UK in disgrace. It was later decided that Stonehouse struggled with depression due to an investigation into the activities of his companies and had decided he wanted to live as a normal citizen. This led him to fake his own death and gained him a seven-year sentence in prison for fraud. It was later discovered in Downing Street papers that Stonehouse had also been a paid spy for the Czechoslovakian government from 1962 and gave information about government policies and aircrafts. This information was not released earlier as there was no real evidence to convict him. John Stonehouse died in 1988 without having faced the rumours of being a spy. While this arrest did not result in finding Lord Lucan, it did show people that it was possible to disappear and get a new identity. The theory that Lucan was alive and using a new name would be prevalent in the years after the disappearance, despite this false start. In the years following, more sightings of Lucan would be reported. Some of the earlier sightings led the police to France, Colombia and Africa. The search for Lucan was now international and lots of people were interested in his apprehension. It was a subject that became a worldwide fascination for the public. But this came with the problem that Lucan was apparently being sighted in all sorts of places and this took up a lot of police time. In 1982, the Scottish bounty hunter, John Miller, famed for apprehending the train robber, Ronnie Biggs, in 1981, claimed to have found Lord Lucan in a small town in Venezuela. He also claimed to have spoken to him for around three hours. According to Miller, Lucan explained that he had not killed the nanny, and if he had done, why wouldn't he have killed his wife too? Miller provided detailed information about how Lucan escaped from Britain, claiming that he escaped Britain by boat to Spain, and from Spain he travelled to Algeciras, straight on to South Africa where he lived for a while. From there he then travelled to Paraguay, and then on to Venezuela. Miller also provided a description of Lucan's living conditions, and described him as living in squalor in a shack but was looking remarkably fit. Miller explained to the media that three men were holding Lucan until they could prove his identity, but that Lucan wanted to return back to England. After arriving in Miami, travelling through Trinidad, Miller began telling his story to media outlets. The Trinidad and Tobago police chief explained that he had heard of the rumoured arrest of Lord Lucan, However, Scotland Yard said at the time that they knew nothing about the allegations relating to Lord Lucan and were not investigating them. The allegations that John Miller was holding Lucan could have been seen as believable by some, but they were later shown to be a hoax by the now defunct British newspaper News of the World. 
Through their investigation, it was proven that Miller had made up the allegations of ever finding or holding Lucan, and he had had no evidence to back up his claims. In 2003, the theory that Lucan was living abroad and hiding out was still a possibility to many, and sightings were still being reported to police. In this year, 2003, a book titled Dead Lucky, written by Duncan McLaughlin, a former Scotland Yard detective, was published. The book documented that McLaughlin had spoken to Mark Winch, a small-time drug dealer who had fled to Goa in 1991. Winch lived in an area of Goa called Shimira, and he had met a man who he believed was Lord Lucan. The man was called Barry Halpin, and he appeared to display many of the traits that Lucan possessed. He was good at backgammon, spoke German, and had an extensive knowledge of expensive cars. Plus, he spoke English, and appeared to be English. Winch explained that he was once drinking heavily with Halpin, when he asked if he, like other Westerners in Goa, was a fugitive. Apparently, Halpin replied, isn't everybody? This convinced Winch to contact Duncan McLaughlin, who was intrigued and fascinated by the fact that they may have discovered Lucan. Holidaymakers who had met Barry Halpin, or Jungle and Mountain Barry, as were his nicknames, explained that he was a well-spoken and interesting man, but they didn't think that he was Lord Lucan. Halpin's family explained that Barry from St Helens in the north of England, had been a teacher for a number of years, travelling around Australia and living almost as a hippie. While living in Goa, he was homeless and often could be found in many of the bars in the area. Barry Halpin was listed in a Goa newspaper as dying in 1996. Duncan McLaughlin believes in his book that Barry Halpin was in fact Lord Lucan, and that Lucan had taken on Halpin's identity, possibly after Halpin had already died. McLaughlin believes that while they do not have any proof in terms of DNA evidence, they do have forensic analysis of the photographs of Lucan and Halpin, and they were deemed to be similar. Lots of people close to both Barry Halpin and to Lord Lucan dismissed the claims that McLaughlin made in his book and do not believe that this is a plausible theory. Halpin's family describe him as just a banjo player from St Helens and provided evidence that Halpin was who he said he was through birth certificates and records. Friends and family close to Lucan also dismissed the claims, particularly Lady Lucan who did not believe that her husband would have lived in such a manner. In recent years, the theory that Lucan's distinguished friends helped him to escape Britain has gained more popularity as a theory in his disappearance. The theory that Lucan had fled to Africa was not a new theory, but it wasn't until 2012 that the secretary of Lucan's friend, John Aspinall, came out with a story of her own. The secretary who had assumed the name Jill Findlay explained that she had been invited into meetings with her boss and James Goldsmith, the millionaire businessman who discussed letting Lucan see his children from a distance. To do this, the secretary had to book tickets for the children to Africa. She explained that she booked flights on two different occasions between 1979 to 1981. She knew that the children would have visited Kenya and Gabon. She was concerned about what the opinion of her would have been and therefore she did not come forward with the information. But in 2012, she assured Scotland Yard that she would be willing to give a statement. This was corroborated by the fact that during the 1980s, when the investigation was being treated as a cold case, the information given by informants in Africa was that there had been sightings. 
George Bingham, Lord Lucan's son, believes to this day that this is incorrect, and that he had never been to either of those places in Africa. While Susan Maxwell Scott, the last person to see Lucan, did not mention Africa, she did mention that she believed Lucan's circle of friends had financed him to leave the country. Maxwell Scott, however, explained that she thought he had been killed by this high-profile group when the search for him became too large, believing him to be too much of a burden to keep hold of. So, what do we really know about Lord Lucan? It is clear that there is a lot of speculation surrounding his disappearance, but the truth is, there is little in the way of evidence. The facts we do know is that straight after his disappearance, the bankruptcy of his estate continued, and the creditors were told that he had unsecured debts of £45,000. The family silver was sold in 1976 for £30,000, and the Lucan Family Trust repaid the other part of the debts. Lucan's family were given probate of his estate in 1999, but no death certificate was issued. At the time, his son, George Bingham, was refused the right to take his father's title and seat in the House of Lords due to the fact that he had not been declared legally dead. In 2016, following the Presumption of Death Act 2013, which allows persons to apply to the High Court to declare a person dead, George Bingham put in another request to have his father declared dead. This went through the courts and was approved on the 3rd of February 2016. George Bingham then officially became the 8th Earl of Lincoln. It is important to note that his son was affected by being in the house that night and by his father's subsequent disappearance. He maintains that he does not believe that his father would have pre-planned an attack in their house, knowing that his children could walk down the stairs at any moment and see the incident. He also states that his father loved them very much and wouldn't have been able to bear it. The children lived with their mother until 1982, when all custody was given to their aunt and uncle, Lady Lucan's sister Christina, and her husband, William Shand Kidd. Lady Lucan, up until her death this year, has also dismissed any theories of her husband living abroad, and that this would not have suited him, and has maintained her theory that he committed suicide not long after the crime. She continued to tell the same story of the incident throughout her life, and did not entertain any other theories on the case. The disappearance of Lord Lucan is an infamous case that captured the nation and the entire world with its twists and turns, and for many, it will continue to be an important case of someone vanishing completely without a trace. This is where the third episode about Lord Lucan ends. We hope you enjoyed these episodes and we just want to thank everyone who has reviewed us on iTunes and engaged with us on Twitter and Facebook. Please contact us at The Unseen Podcast on Twitter and on Facebook. In future episodes, we hope to include some stories from the public. So if you have a loved one who is missing or just a story you find fascinating, please send them in to us, either on Twitter, Facebook or at our email address, theunseenpod at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen. Thank you.